Diamond B Sports presents the American Sports Cavalcade. A panorama of speed, color, drama, and excitement. The American Sports Cavalcade. Indianapolis a city whose name has become synonymous with automotive performance and speed. The home of not one, but two of the greatest auto racing facilities and events in the world. Here, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the site of the Indy 500, stands empty, patiently waiting until next year's Memorial Day race. And just a few miles away is this facility, Indianapolis Raceway Park, which is jammed with an overflow crowd of race fans, anxiously awaiting the start of the greatest single event on the National Hot Rod Association Tour, the U.S. Nationals. Considered the granddaddy of them all to drag racers, the U.S. National is the oldest and most prestigious race of the season. Just how important is Indy to the drivers? Well, two-time world champion funny car driver Frank Hawley has said, there are only two things I remember at the end of the season, who won the world championship and who won Indy. Hello, I'm Ed Bruce, and we're very proud to be once again bringing you this very special event, the U.S. Nationals. As always on hand today to call the action for us, Brock Yates and Steve Evans. And now let's go to Steve, who's standing by with his thoughts on today's action. It seems that every sport has its hallowed ground. Wrigley Field, Yankee Stadium, Augusta, Churchill Downs, and to the drag racing fraternity, Indianapolis Raceway Park. This year, celebrating its silver anniversary as home of the NHRA U.S. Nationals. A win here can turn a dismal season into a successful one. It can turn a struggling part-timer into a sponsored pro. And conversely, a couple of poor performances here can tarnish the image of the most established hero. But there's a lot more to this event and to IRP than just a strip of pavement and a Christmas tree. Brock? Right you are, Steve. There is a whole lot more. But you know, when you think about racing at Indianapolis, I guess the famed old Brickyard first comes to mind. But we're about 10 miles down the road here at Indianapolis Raceway Park. And I'll tell you what, it's a first-class facility in its own right. First, there's a two and a half mile road course running around the perimeters of the property and a beautiful five eighths mile asphalt oval where the stock cars and midgets run regularly. But of course, the centerpiece of the place is the 4,000 foot drag strip, where as you say, all kinds of history has been made over the 25 years of the U.S. Nationals. And Brock, that tradition actually began in 1955, the first U.S. Nationals at Great Bend, Kansas. In the 31st running of this event, well, there was a unique car in the first round of Top Fuel Eliminator. You know, the first Indy the U.S. Nationals you qualify for is always a special one, particularly if you do it in a car that's so different, uh, the competition laughed at you. Well, they're not laughing at Dave Miller from Illinois now. In the first round, he was up against Daryl Gwynn, the freshman racer from Miami, Florida, just 23. In fact, uh, it was so painful, Brock, that on the nose of uh, Dave Miller's car, it says, there is no anguish known to the human race like the pain of a new idea. And the idea in this case is a very short little car that he hopes will have better weight transfer. Unfortunately for Dave, qualifying was the only glory he was to enjoy at this year's U.S. Nationals. Darrell Gwynn put him out first round. I talked to Dave when it was over. Well, when you've been out and out laughed at for trying something new in the top fuel eliminator category, those are pretty uh, appropriate sentiments. But nobody's laughing now, Dave. Maybe you lost here in the first round. But what a job. 570 lapse times in a car about 10 feet shorter than anybody's got. We sure have had a good time this weekend. And uh, a lot of help from all the people, Gene Snow, Don Garlitz. They've all given us a hand. Uh, I've tried to put it to good use. We would have done a little better. I guess I hazed the tires there, but I was I was trying to do good. You know, a lot of people didn't think you'd come back from that horrific fire at Brainerd, Minnesota. That was a bad one. Uh, we wanted to be at Indy. We spent two weeks putting it back together, a little less paint, uh, put together what left, what pieces I had left, and uh, I'm out of pistons. Uh, I had enough to do one more round. That was it. Well, on behalf of a lot of people that are eating a little crow right now. Congratulations on a good effort, and I know it's going to go better. I really appreciate it. It's the happiest day of my life to this point in my career. <laughs> well, our congratulations to Diamond Dave Miller for trying to upset the apple cart here at Indianapolis. And this man had the same idea in mind. Graham Cowan came all the way from Australia to compete in the funny car ranks. And believe me, it too, as he told Steve Evans, was a high point for him. Well, I'll tell you what, Steve, this is probably the highlight of my career. Well, not probably, it is a highlight of my career. And I'm proud to be a part of this NHRA deal here. 
and I'm very, very proud of my country, Australia. And uh, this is the toughest field in history, and boy, I'm just doing handstands about this deal. Well, down under, you already have the America's Cup. Now you want the U.S. Nationals Trophy. Well, that's where that boxing kangaroo came from. That was the America's Cup deal, so we stole it off them, so maybe that's a uh, good luck charm, right? Good luck to you. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Well, it was Graham against 15 Americans, including John Force from Yorba Linda, California, one of the best in the funny car ranks. And you know what, Steve Evans? Graham gave him a fine race. Indeed he did. Not only is this an Australian driver, it's an all-Australian crew, headed by Gary Evans, who got his tutelage for a couple of seasons under Kenny Bernstein. But on the starting line, Graham Cowan was just a little late, as you'll see here. John Force had the quicker reaction time, but on the far end, it was a charging Australian. Not quite enough. And a fiery blower explosion on John Force's Corvette. He had a lot of work to do to bring it back for the second round. Well, Steve, uh, John Forrest was also outgunned in the ET time by two one-hundredths of a second by Graham Cowan. They both put up the same miles per hour, 253 miles an hour, but as you say, it was that wink of a quicker reaction time by John Forrest that brought him the victory. It's almost like the car knew something was going to go wrong. The escape hatch was already flapping before the fire. Now, that's a very expensive situation for John Forrest, one that uh, even the richest of racers can ill afford. And he doesn't have a whole lot of time, as you well know, to get ready. John Forrest's car sustained an awful lot of damage in addition to the engine and the blower, as you can see, took the windshield right out. And, of course, there is the destroyed blower on top of that monstrously expensive engine. And in the shadow of the control tower, the first pair are suited up and ready for round two of Top Fuel. That's the face of Connie Coletta, who comes to Indianapolis on a roll. Two major victories in a row. His opponent in second round action will be this man, even more famous, Big Daddy Don Garlitz. Earlier, Steve had a chance to talk to this famous man about this race. Don, I detect a totally different feeling about your effort here this year as opposed to last year, and it was a far more casual. It's not casual. I mean, last the year. world championship is at stake. A lot of money is on the line. Coletta has a good chance of moving ahead if he can put me out in this round. He has lane choice. We can't make any mistakes. None are allowed. Now, he intentionally tried to get on the same side of the ladder to get you early. That's good strategy, I guess, on his part. I don't believe that. I don't think he, I think he had a run of bad runs, because I saw the last run yesterday. He smoked the tires and shook. Yeah, well, that's what he's saying, it's anyway. a good story. You bet. Go get him. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> Connie, everybody has been talking about your hopes uh, during qualifying to actually uh, to get into qualifying so you could face Garlitz. Uh, was that actually a, a strategy or was that just pit talk? No, it was, definitely a, it was definitely a gamble that we took. We tried to qualify the car not quite as good as it did. My idea of it was to try and get in the bottom half of the field and possibly race him the first round. Well, as it turned out, I stayed in the top half of the field and I'll race in the second round, which really worked out to the advantage because it gave me a slower car for the first lap today, which actually is possibly a tune-up lap on it, which is really going to work out well because our air has changed quite a bit. Now, to explain Coletta's motivation, he is 1,900 points behind Garlitz in the World Championship chase. The U.S. Nationals is worth one and a half times as many points as the usual race. So Coletta thought that he could get rid of Garlitz early here has a chance of catching him. Boy, absolutely right, and Steve, and everybody in this place is on their feet. This giant crowd, boy, they are. this is what they come to see. The great names of this sport go head to head, and there is no greater name than that man behind that wheel of that black dragster. That is Big Daddy Don Garlitz, and almost as famous and certainly almost as successful, Connie Coletta. Well, you mentioned Coletta has won the last two races, but before that, Big Daddy scored four victories. But Garlitz, as you kind of heard, he's a little worried about Coletta. Coletta has lane choice. He defeats. Defeated Big Daddy in round one of the previous race in Brainerd, Minnesota. I guarantee you, as you said, there is nobody at the hot dog stand when these two meet. <laughs> oh, you better believe it. Steve, we've got some problems maybe with Garlitz's car. I don't think it's a problem so much as he doesn't like the way the car is idling. He has crew chief Herb Parks adjusting the barrel valve and the fuel injector just to idle the engine a bit higher, keep it running cleaner. Herb says everything is fine, Big. Garlitz goes to the starting line. Well, Steve, you can count on one thing. They are going to try to psych each other out. They've raced each other hundreds of times over the last couple of decades, so nobody has got any tricks up their sleeve, I would imagine. A repeat of the final round of last year's race. Second round action. It is Garlitz off the Martin. It is Garlitz driving away. Winning it by a little last 
to that car late, and he won it really on the starting line. Garlett's a 563 to Coletta's close 565, but Big Daddy enjoyed a 400s advantage right off the mark. Oh boy, you can see it right there. Garlitz in the far lane moves well ahead of Coletta, and then Connie right here smokes the tires. Garlitz does a little bit of the same right about there, but goes on to take the victory by almost a full car length. A good, sound victory by Big Daddy against a longtime rival. Don, a lot of people were saying that that could be the race of the day, and they certainly were not disappointed. It was a good race, and the car ran good. It was clean. I'm surprised it didn't run any better than 563. Well, that's what it ran. It looked like maybe it fell behind just a little bit at the start. Might have. It acted like it didn't have quite enough clutch in it. Where did you make your move on him? In the, right at the top of low gear. Was there ever a time you were a little concerned maybe you weren't going to get around him or stay ahead of him? Because it happens real quick out through low gear, you know. That's where they make If he go, if he'd have went out in front of me in low gear, it would have been all over. Well, that's the one you had to stop. You get Joe Amato probably next. Yeah. Good race. Connie Collette and Don Garlitz. There was a lot of friendly conversation before this race, but Connie, just one second, you threw everything you had at him. You just had a little more. Yeah, it just did. The car went out and shook the tires. We thought we had enough power to pull it through the shake, and it didn't work. You had some fun with this one, didn't you? Oh, yeah, I tried. What can you say? You know, you go for broke on it and do it. Yeah, the fans, thank you. I thank you for a great show. That was one car race. All right, who went, who, who run what? You ran 563. You ran a little bit slow. I see. All right, well, whatever. <laughs> There was a day when Connie wouldn't have taken defeat quite as graciously as he does now, but he's having fun here at Indianapolis. All right, let's go to the next pairing in top fuel, Steve. Well, I mentioned Joe Amato would be Garland's next opponent. Well, I shouldn't do that because first, Joe Amato has got to get around Gene Snow. There's a good chance of him doing that. Amato is the low qualifier and the reigning world champion. And he has come here with a very well-prepared car. He's had some problems over the season. Gene Snow, of course, the man who originated the funny cars years ago, gone on to top fuel ranks very successfully. Joe Amato, a businessman from Pennsylvania, a part-time racer, yet he's the world champion. And you know, we talked about Coletta and Garlitz in the point. Well, actually, Joe Amato is closer to Garlitz than Coletta was. So Amato I really would have liked to see Garlitz go up. And looking on, Shirley Mulvaney, the three-time top fuel world champion, attending her first drag race since her tragic crash a year ago July in Canada. The lady's getting well. And getting ready to race as well, Steve. She'll be back next season with a major top fuel effort. All right, there we go. That's Gene Snow buttoned up and ready to go in his black gold dragster out of uh, Fort Worth, Texas. One of the grand old names, just like Colette and Garlic. Been around forever. And you can bet Snow has got all the nitro, all the ignition lead, all the blower boost he can muster. He'll need it against the man in the far lane, Joe Amato, who has posted the quickest time so far of this entire event. Three stage stage, and they're off the mark. They live right together. Joe Amato takes charge on the far end. Joe Amato, he puts down Gene Snow with a 560, a fine run to Snow's 569. Gene was off the mark first, but Amato just had too much power. Yes, he did. Amato makes a nice straight pass here. Gene Snow got a little bit sideways, about uh, 300 yards out and almost crossed the center line. But after that, it was all Joe Amato who goes on to, as you say, an easy victory. So, as you predicted, Steve Evans, it will be Big Daddy Don Garlitz against Joe Amato in the next round. Interesting matchup. Well, Joe Amato wasn't pleased seeing Don Garlitz get around Connie Coletta, but he certainly is pleased with his own victory over Gene Snow, a 5-6-0. It was pretty good. There was still more room in there. I could have done a little bit of valve work, if you know, but Gene was close. But the car is coming around, and it's staying steady, you know, and consistent, and we're not blowing the blower off. And I owe that to Tim Richards and my crew. They're doing an outstanding job this weekend. And now you're going to get the black car from Florida. Yeah, we're going to have to have a little race here. Connie couldn't put them out. We're going to have to do it. And you know, we can control our own destiny in the world championship. If we can beat Don, it'll be to our advantage to, to make a fight about it. All right. So the stage is set for what could be the duel of the day in top fuel between Joe Amato and Big Daddy Don Garlitz. Meantime, this is what they call a thrash in drag racing. The John Force crew has been joined by the crew of the Chi Town Hustler in an attempt to repair Force's badly damaged funny car. Body work and engine being worked on.
Well, John Force's body car is still completely apart as the crew tries to repair the damage from that floor explosion in the first round, but he's got a little bit of time because we're still in the second round of Top Fuel Eliminator. For the next pairing, we'll find Dick LaHaye versus Gary Ormsby. This is LaHaye Brock, who won, as you'll recall, the Gator Nationals, the second race of the season, and his only real help is his daughter, Kim, crew chief of the whole deal. And a very, very competitive man. A guy that doesn't run with quite the financing of some of the other teams, Steve, but very highly respected as a driver. Absolutely. He's always very hungry on the starting line. In fact, that Gator Nationals victory came with two hole shots out of four rounds. So Dick LaHaye is always ready on the line. You can count on that, the man from Michigan. Now he's up against a state-of-the-art top fuel dragster from Roseville, California, driven by auto dealer and professional racer Gary Ormsby. Ormsby has one national event win to his credit, the Winter Nationals, a couple of seasons back. But I tell you, this car has got every trick in drag racing on board. The fuel system, the body, everything is here. So it's kind of big box versus a low buck operation and uh, two very experienced drivers. But this could be a question of just raw horsepower, Steve. Well, Ormsby was one of LaHaye's victims at the Gator Nationals. And Ormsby was grumbling a little bit that maybe LaHaye, as they say, used him up on the starting line. Took too much time. Ormsby wants some revenge on that. Well, he's going to get it right now, perhaps. But then again, Dick LaHaye can never be counted out as he moves toward the starting line. This could be an interesting matchup between two very competitive drivers. Well, Gary Ormsby, the far lane, already pre-staged, waiting on LaHaye. LaHaye never is hurried on that starting line. They use a handbrake to inch the cars forward. All four lights are on, and they're off the mark. LaHaye is away first. LaHaye with another good hole shot. But from behind, Gary Ormsby, you saw his crew chief, Lee Beard, a smile on his face. Ormsby wins at 563 to a losing 570. Well, I'll tell you what, Steve. Dick LaHaye gave Gary Ormsby all he wanted and then some. Very quick reaction time on the part of LaHaye. He's out first, he said. And it just is a case, really, of raw horsepower on the part of Gary Ormsby that wins this race for him. If it had just been driving skill, it might have gone the other way. Interesting half a car length victory by Gary Ormsby. Well, a lot of the pre-race talk has been about Don Garlitz and Connie Coletta and Joe Amato, while this man, Gary Ormsby, has been very quietly running as quicker, quicker than any of them. Gary, you're going into the semis of 562. Yeah, it, uh, I need a little bit there. That was a close race. Yeah, you were behind a little bit right at the yeah. start, it looked like. Yeah, I, he may have got out on me a little bit there. I I didn't want to take a chance up there. I knew I had the power, and and like I, said, I was getting to wonder a little bit, though, <laughs> towards the end there. It was plenty close. You know, you won the Winter Nationals a year or so ago, but there's nothing like winning this one. Oh, I'd love to win this, Steve. It's for the guys, and they, they're the ones making this thing run today, so we want to win it for them and for everybody. All right, let's go back to the starting line right now, Gary, and see who you're going to race in the next round. Well, right now, Gary Ormsby, based on that pass, has moved right into the middle of the contenders here at the U.S. Nationals. But here is a young comer that is also trying to elbow his way into the ranks. Darrell Gwynn, remember, Steve, we saw him put away Diamond Dave in his little short wheelbase car in the first round action. Well, if there's such a thing as an easy one here at the U.S. Nationals, Darrell Gwynn has drawn it. Bob Simmons in the far lane is the only car that qualified with a Donovan power plant, Brock. That was the first aluminum aftermarket engine built for drag racing, and it's been passed by now. It's still popular in the sportsman ranks, but Simmons is the only one I know of in the country who runs that engine in top fuel. He's from Connecticut. Now, looking back at first round action, Simmons was to race Bill Mullins, but Mullins was shut off on the starting line. Actually, never even got the engine properly fired. Was really disappointed, especially after his Spring Nationals victory earlier. Now, here in qualifying, you'll see see why Mullins had his starting line problems. They worked all night to try to fix the damage from that blur explosion and just didn't get it done right. This was really a boomer. It sure was. About a two on the Richter scale. Tough break for Mullins. A good break for Bob Simmons. He got a bye in the first round and moved in against Daryl Gwynn in the second round. Of course, blowers are critical devices in top fuel drag racing. Earlier, Steve had a chance to look at one of these pieces of equipment. Here bolted to a handy stand on the door of Daryl Gwynn's trailer is the heart and soul of these nitro-burning engines, be they top fuel dragsters or funny cars. Virtually everybody has the same cylinder block and pistons and rods and camshafts and crankshafts, but 
Above that, everybody has a different combination. The fuel injector here, air rushes in the front, bolted to this 1471 supercharger. The rotor's whirling inside at about 50% the speed of the engine, or twice the speed of the engine. The blower bolted to the manifold. Now, the fuel comes up from the pump, also another important part of the system, into the fuel system, where it's distributed in a maze of lines and nozzles, all of which can be changed to tune the engine. Now, every racer hopes that he's got some secret in his fuel system they don't share much knowledge about this part of the engine. Everybody trying to get the advantage here. And when they work right, you're a winner. When they work wrong, you see what happened to Bill Mullen's car. Those blower explosions can be very costly and dangerous as well. All right, Darrell Gwynn moving in against what is probably the biggest underdog in this particular field, Bob Simmons out of New England. Steve, Gwynn ought to have a fairly easy time of it against an essentially amateur a race team like Simmons. Well, as long as nothing goes wrong, one thing that you can count on, Darrell Gwynn and his dad have agreed, they will not play push the light. If uh, Bob Simmons gets away a couple of hundreds uh, before them, that's fine. They'll try to drive around him. Uh, that was his dad just shaking Daryl Glenn's hand, pointing at the heat, I'm sure, for the water temperature, saying everything's just fine. Take it easy. We can beat this guy. Now, Simmons, no one's having more fun than Bob Simmons. He didn't come here to win the U.S. National. He came here to participate, maybe learn something, and further his career. But the, they are sportsman racers in the sure sense of the world. Simmons is off first, but he smokes the tires. Simmons had the whole downfield loaded for Bear, and the tires just couldn't handle that much power. Daryl Gwynn with the quickest elapsed time so far of the round. 557, 256 miles an hour. And that'll give Daryl Lane choice over Gary Ormsby when they meet in the semis. How about a motto versus Garlitz, the reigning world champion against the man that wants to steal his crown. Right now, let's join Ed Bruce. Thanks, Steve. The history of the U.S. Nationals competition is rich in tradition, and last year was no exception. The top fuel championship matched two old friends, veterans of over 20 years of racing experience in their quest for the coveted title. It was the ever-youthful 52-year-old Big Daddy Don Garlitz in the near lane versus his old friend and competitor Connie Khalid in the far lane. 20 years earlier, Garlitz had won his first U.S. Nationals, and if he could win today, it would be his sixth U.S. Nationals title. Both cars pulled into the saging beams, and both were off to a good start. But then some smoke from Kalita's car indicated a loss of traction, and Garlitz pulled into the lead. Kalita stayed with it, but he couldn't overtake Don Garlitz, who powered home to his sixth U.S. national win. In that one race, over 50 years of drag racing experience was displayed for the record crowd. And Big Daddy Ed back again. He's a year older, but the car is brand new and already has disposed of Connie Coletta. Right now, let's join up with Brock Yates with a special guest. Obviously, Shirley, it's great to see you back, and uh, I'm sure everybody would like to know how you are feeling specifically. Well, I feel I feel really good. Uh, I don't move very fast. Uh, I can't walk that far, but I'm I, since I've I've started I've learned how to walk again. I just have to build up some strength and be able to you know hold my own. Is it on schedule now? The recovery, as far as uh, everybody's concerned, the doctors are concerned. Are they pleased the way they things going are going? They're very pleased. But actually, I'm about five months ahead of what they originally thought. And Dr. Terry Trammell from Indianapolis, he he was the. The, the major difference uh, he said right from the start in January after he operated that I would drive a I would drive a race car again so I was pretty confident that was good to hear <laughs> and surely guys like Joe Amato Don Garlitz and Gary Beck they're all awaiting your return as well everybody glad to hear you're coming back and here we're looking at crew chief Tim Richards preparing the Joe Amato car for what Brock Yates said could be the duel of the day their race coming up against Big Daddy Don Garlitz Back at the U.S. Nationals, Indianapolis, Indiana, I'm Brock Yates along with Steve Evans and Ed Bruce. The car you see doing its burnout is that of John Ford. They made those repairs successfully, and he is ready for his race against this car and this man, Jim Head, the defending champion at the U.S. National State. That's right, Brock. He won this race a year ago, and that's one particular car you never seem to see on fire or blowers pitched off it. He runs the car very conservatively, and is out there playing the numbers, hoping you'll beat yourself. Now, the only thing they're sure of with John Forces' car is it'll start. 
Well, they did some emergency repairs. Remember, as we said, they not only hurt the engine, they hurt the bodywork. And the man right there in that picture is primarily responsible for it. That is Austin Coyle, the man who brought two world championships to the Chi-Town Hustler, left that team this year to campaign for this man, John Ford. And he, of course, has turned him into a major contender. Jim Head comes into Indianapolis, Brock, feeling pretty good about things. He won the last race on the tour, the Quaker State North Star Nationals in Brainerd, Minnesota. And there he did it with consistent, but not necessarily quick elapsed times. So Head's just going to go to the starting line, hoping something goes wrong with John Forrest's car. Head uh, usually runs in that 590, maybe a high 580 range. John Force is capable of running 560s, 570s all day long. But just the luck has never been with him to win an NHRA national event. On the other hand, Jim Head's less horsepower and less sponsorship has paid off for him on a number of occasions, but he doesn't do anything tricky. He's very predictable, isn't he? Yes, he is. And coming to the starting line right now, about 6,000 collective horsepower, nitro burning, fiberglass body, double-A fuel funny cars. They are just a bear to drive. They shake, they rattle, occasionally they'll even roll. The driver takes a lot of punishment inside these cars. His vision is often blurred. They're just really Formula Harry, as he calls them. They left right together, but Jim Head had too much tire smoke. He got off his throttle. He knew he was done for, but how about John Force? Even with all those repairs, a very competitive 574 at 246 miles an hour. I have a feeling that Jim Head here, Brock, tried to make elapsed time with the clutch. In other words, uh, not horsepower, but tighten that clutch up. The track wouldn't take it. Well, as you can see right here, Force and uh, Head leave just about together, but right away, it's just a wad of smoke from Jim Head's rear slicks, and that is the end of the race. For all intents and purposes, John Force moves on. Seldom does any competitor come back after a disastrous blower explosion with a 574 and a patched up race car. Got a real good race team. Coyle's got them guys busting their backs and uh, got to thank a, a shy town team came over and that takes a lot for another team uh, come over there and help you and they did and and she came what she run 574 with a great hole shot to boot dog it she come right back again my old boy's good just got to make enough money keep him on the payroll <laughs> and that's not as easy as it looks believe me this is an enormously competitive and difficult business and it's hard to keep a team up week in and week out all right that is the parks tower here the beautiful new official building at the starting line at the indianapolis raceway park u.s national site more funny cars on the line steve and this is one of the most familiar sights of all absolutely roland leon's hawaiian car it's a replica of a dodge daytona body and Fort Worth, Texas, Rick Johnson is at the wheel. And they finally got a national event victory as a team. Roland is a car owner, has lots of them. Johnson finally got to the winner's circle this year at the only Canadian race on the tour, the Grand Nationals in Montreal. Rick Johnson's competition this second round action, uh, truly a legendary car. The car known more than uh, some of the drivers that have been in it, Rock. It's called the Blue Max. Raymond Beetle over to three world championships, has decided to pay more attention to uh, his empire. Now it's John Lombardo from Los Angeles at the wheel. And a mighty cool character he is, Steve. One of the iciest men behind the wheel of a funny car we've ever seen. He just doesn't fluster. He does a beautiful job at the starting line. But right now, his mind is on the competition. Rick Johnson, who, as you know, earlier this year, set a world record for Funny Car E.T. Indeed he did, Brock. Well, here's that ice man you were talking about from the L.A. suburb of Saugus, John Lombardo. He just drives the car. He doesn't worry about it. He doesn't wrench on it. Rick Johnson, on the other hand, he's a very important part of this team. He's expected to do as much mechanical work as anybody. Well, he can't do anything right now, Steve, because he's bolted into the cockpit, but they have been working a little bit on that Hawaiian punch car. Roland Leong was out there, as were a couple of the crewmen, and they seem to be having a little bit of a problem at this point. Well, no problem whatsoever for John Lombardo. He is a past national event winner when the Winston World Finals in his own car. A few years back, he's got the roof hatch open for a little ventilation. And here comes Rick Johnson. Hey, they are concerned with that car, Brock. Now the body is up. Roland Leon looking at the fuel system, the blower drive area. Roland says, shut it off, Rick. So it appears it's all over. Wait a minute. Now all of a sudden, they changed their mind and motion Johnson to the starting line. Now this, I don't know, Brock, this could be one of those deals where they just hope Lombardo will cross the center line or red light, eliminate himself. Be interesting to see if Rick Johnson leaves the line, if there is indeed a problem that could be hazardous to his health. Well, there's no question that uh, Roland told him to shut it off, but here they go. They're running the full quarter mile with a Hawaiian. 
He loses, unfortunately. Rick Johnson goes down to a 577, 250 miles an hour. A disappointed man here, Roland Leong, but uh, we're a little confused about what caused him to say, shut it down. Buster Couch, the chief starter, offers consolation. We'll try to solve this mystery of Rick Johnson after this. The NHRA U.S. Nationals, Indianapolis Raceway Park. I'm Brock Gates along with Ed Bruce and Steve Evans. Remember Rick Johnson in his on-again, off-again act at the starting line before losing to John Lombardo? Well, Steve Evans is caught up with Rick to find out why. Well, oftentimes in the starting line, the driver is the last to know what the problem was. Rick, do you have any idea? No, the throttle stuck way up for some reason on the smoky burnout. They told me to shut it off. Well, I couldn't shut it off, you know, not this far along. I still don't see what's wrong. For some reason, the motor was just idling about 2,000 RPMs too fast. And I tried to leave with him and had a fairly close race score, and then the motor went away in the middle, so I just turned it off. And with the RPMs up that high, it can be hard to hold him with the brake as well. Well, I had to use the clutch pedal and stuff to keep it up there and thought maybe I could squirt out on him there pretty good with the motor up. But I did the best I could. I just couldn't win. You sure did. Thanks, Steve. Well, a good try under some very difficult circumstances when you try to hold down about 3,000 horsepower on a race car that doesn't want to behave. All right, the next pair. This is Ed McCullough in the Larry Miner team funny car coming to the line against a man who's been running very, very well, Steve, Dale Pauldy. But interestingly enough, it's Ed McCullough who has lane choice here because his 5.82 in the first round was quicker than Dale Pauldy's 5.86. But it was Poldy's good driving that defeated Tom McEwen, who was the quickest qualifier of them all. Here, Mike Hamby lowering the body on the Buick Somerset Regal. And a unique body style, Steve. One of the newest cars on the funny car trail. This little uh, Somerset body has had some aerodynamic work. You see the big, big wing that Dale's carrying on it. They've had quite a bit of development work with this new shape. But right now, it's a strong running car, and Dale has been very successful behind it. Real. Indeed, and when the smoke clears from the burnout, you can see at the rear of the car what they call the wheelie bars. Now, these cars are off the starting line. They launch so hard that often they carry that front end, and those adjustable wheelie bars will allow it to only come up so high. Well, a lot of people, of course, see those burnouts, and they think maybe it's just for show, but it isn't. It's to warm up those rear tires. Ed McCullough, he is with the Larry Miner team, as I said, Steve, and a real veteran. And won a couple of U.S. Nationals in the 70s. Still Poley, well, he's won a number of NHRA national events, but the big one, Indy, has always eluded him. Okay, so here we go. The two of the old-timers in this business, two real professionals. Once again, like most of the guys in the funny car big leagues, you don't really play any tricks on each other, do you? They know everybody's tricks. Well, anyone who has on either one of these drivers has faced the consequences when he got out of the car at the other end, I assure you. <laughs> yeah, these guys can exhibit some temper when things don't go too well, but right now, they're just about the stage and square off in what could be an interesting race. Just about evenly matched as far as ETs in the first round are concerned. That's right. They go to the starting line just a couple of hundreds apart. Inch and in, they're ready. The flash of the pro start. They leave right together. A little tire smoke on Poli's car. McCullough gets out of the groove. It is Dale Poli in a piston burning 582 hole shot victory. McCullough ran quicker at 5.80, but was a little slow off the mark. Absolutely. A reaction time of 0.483 versus a 534 you can see it here there is Poldy in the far lane just launching out ahead of Ed McCullough and that is really what spelled victory because as you can see Dale smoked the tires a little bit and then lost the motor in the lights but it was enough off the line to bring him about a six inch victory so a 582 and a 250 mile an hour victory for Dale Poldy a happy young man believe me well, Dale Poli, it was your talented feet that won that one. You ran a good deal uh, slower that he didn't beat him. Uh, I'm good. I'm glad. He's uh, real good on the start line generally, and I had to do it because I knew we were a little down on Pep, and I didn't know what he was going to run or what we were going to run. I have no idea. Just uh, We made an agreement. Let's make it a race. Well, you did do that. A lot of pride as far as the driver is concerned in his reaction time. It's kind of a badge of honor. Yeah, it is, especially when you have a crew that works so hard as ours does and stuff, and if I let them down, then it's... I'm. <laughs> I'm in the doghouse. <laughs> it looked like it wanted to smoke the tires. It tried everything it could to smoke the tires and stuff, and we've been having that trouble here all weekend. This car usually never shakes or anything. It's doing it here all weekend long. So we've got a little problem. we just got to figure it out. He'll do it. Thank you. 
all kinds of mysteries in these race cars. Uh, it looks simple, but believe me, there is so much complication. And here is a man that for a long time uh, seemed to lose the combination, Steve. Now it's starting to come back. And you're talking about the man in the airline, four-time world champion Don Perdome in that Firebird-bodied car. He is up against Kenny Bernstein, the state-of-the-art computer-equipped funny car that leads the NHRA World Point standing. Bernstein made this year win his first ever world championship. He could clinch it here today. Don Perdome, well, he's on the comeback trail, but he's in tough here. Perdome had a gift in the first round when Alistair Greeny red-lighted. He only ran like 6.50 seconds. Bernstein sizzled the racetrack in round one at 5.70. So the edge here has got to go to the red car in the far lane, Kenny Bernstein. It sure does. They have found the combination, and they've held it all season long. The car has been literally almost automatic. It's just run like a machine. It's almost as if Bernstein has just sat in there and kind of steered it to take nothing away from Kenny, but they have that car so well dialed in that he is just awesome in terms of his consistency on the drag strip. Well, if sure desire can win a drag race, they'll ride with Don Perdome here in the near lane. There's no one's trying harder. They're off the mark together. Bernstein Perdome. Bernstein has more power. Drives away from the snake. The Kruger Kenny Bernstein liking that win like another 5-7-0. Like you said, it's like it's on automatic. So it'll be Kenny Bernstein facing up with John Lombardo in the semifinals. Dale Poley will be up against the comeback guy of the race so far, John Force. Force will have the lane choice. And these hands belong to one of the crewmen on the Raymond Beetle Blue Max team. His driver, John Lombardo, will have the dubious honor of facing the most consistent man in this racetrack, Kenny Bernstein. And Brock, when these two Dallas base cars get together, it is always a war. Darrell Gwynn's team is a family operation, and this young lady, Shelly Stanton, is about to become a formal member. She is Darrell's fiance, and right now her job is to load that fuel tank full of almost 100% nitromethane, Steve. And over in the funny car pits, well, mechanical work going on there on Kenny Bernstein's car. And all of a sudden, with two back-to-back -back 570s, that looms as the car to beat. They'll tangle with John Lombardo when we get to that semifinal round. Bernstein has one of the largest crews in funny car racing and one of the quietest. If anybody talks, it's crew chief Dale Armstrong, who's probably in the trailer right now, playing with the computer. They are just a silent group. Right now, time for a different sort of drag racing. The Pro Stock Car, 2,350-pound, 500 cubic inch, factory hot rods. Now, this is a very special eliminator during U.S. national competition, the Mr. Gasket Pro Stock Challenge. It features the eight finest pro stocks in the world, determined by an ongoing point system all year long. You receive points for how you qualified at all the NHRA national events. The top eight are meeting here for a prize of $15,000 to the winner. And Steve, coming to the line for the first race is Michigan's Bruce Allen at the wheel of the famed Rare Morrison Camaro, a team that has won four world championships. And they are up against the Firebird of Don Campanello in the far lane. Campanello hails from Wayne, New Jersey. So you got a New Jersey Firebird versus a Texas-based Camaro with a Michigan driver, Bruce Allen. And Allen's short career with Rare Morrison, he's already been to the final round twice. And here he goes in the first round of the Mr. Gasket Pro Stock Challenge. On paper, he would favor the Rear and Morrison car, but Campanella has been running better and better with every race. And look at Campanella. He is running bumper to bumper with a favor Rear and Morrison car, but on the far end, it is Bruce Allen. Possibly something going wrong with Campanella's car. Look at this. Campanella ran quicker, Brock, at 760. Allen went up with a whole shot at 762. And 180 miles an hour, about four miles an hour quicker on the top end, that could have helped spell victory for him as well. All right, Frank Iaconio and Butch Leo. This is Butch Leo, as we've said many, many times before, one of the craftiest men in the starting line. Very few red lights and a whole lot of hole shots. And his opponent in the near lane, the red and white Thunderbird of Frank Iaconio from New Jersey. This is Iaconio's first season with the Ford Motor Company after a number of successful years piloting Chevrolet Camaros. So it's Thunderbird versus Firebird. Butch Leal in the far lane, as you said, Brock, one of the best levers there is, and Iaconio not far behind him. But look at Leal, another one of those hole shots, but he almost loses control at half track. This looks to be Butch Leal by well over a car lake. Indeed, a 768 to Frank Iaconio's losing 772, both of them topping 180 miles an hour. Leo cut as close as you can to a perfect light.
Steve, I guess you could call this a David and Goliath matchup. This is Bob Glidden. What more can we say about him? Five world championships in pro stock. He is going up against David Hutchins, who doesn't pack anywhere near that big a reputation and probably nowhere near as big a racing budget as Glidden's got either. Well, David Hutchins had that big a reputation in the sportsman circles, but has found it a, a very tough transition. He's been in pro stock now, going on his fourth year, and has yet to win one of the big ones. But I'll tell you, the crowd, anytime it's Ford versus Chevrolet, they love it. They'll stand up as the cars move up to stage. Now, they only see one yellow light on that Christmas tree, then four tenths of a second later, the flash of green. That's called the pro start. David Hutchins needs a whole ton of England. Their last time in time trials have not even been close. It truly is. David versus Goliath. That's Glidden in the near lane. Hutchins in the far lane. Hutchins is away too soon. Hutchins leaves a red light on the Christmas tree. Glidden may be behind here in your picture, but he's already a winner. There's in so many cases against. There's uh, wife Etta Glidden watching her husband uh, go on to victory here. As we've said so many times, these youngsters and the less uh, well-financed teams, the less uh, uh, successful of the first on guys just squeeze the light so hard. It's the only possible chance they have in so many cases as it happens with Hutchins, they lose. And you've got a similar set of circumstances here, our final race in this round. Warren Johnson, the Oldsmobile Calais, which is that beautiful black and yellow Camaro from Yuma, Arizona. That is Gordy Rivera. The Brock in our coverage of NHA Championship Drive Racing. On more than one occasion, we've seen Rivera get away with one of those gambles on the starting line, beat some of the big boys, including Rear Morrison. Absolutely. He'll squeeze it as hard as he can, but he faces literally monster horsepower with Warren Johnson. I'm not sure anybody's making as much horsepower as this Oldsmobile is. And Warren really is pretty conservative. All right, Rivera squeezes a light too close. He red lights, gambles, and loses. Warren Johnson goes on to win it with a 760, 180 miles an hour. So he is into the next round. Bob Glidden with low ET of the round so far, top speed of the meet, a 758. Uh, that's not bad, I guess, for today. I think Bruce may have run a 62. Uh, we need to run a little better than that before the day's over, I'm sure, Steve. What kind of changes we make? We, we've been messing around with transmissions and rear ends, and uh, we'll wait till we get back and look at the computer tape and see what the engine did and uh, change from what we see. Okay, thank you, Bob. Here's the way it shapes up in the Mr. Gasket Pro Stock Challenge. Glidden versus Bruce Allen. Glidden with lane choice. Butch Leo versus Warren Johnson. Well, there's a last minute problem in the top fuel staging lane. That air bottle they're working on there is on board Daryl Gwynn's top fuel director. Now that controls the shifting of the transmission. One of the crewmen alertly noticed that that air bottle was down on pressure and needed to be replaced. And they better get one from their trailer and installed in a hurry. Because the first half of the top fuel semi-finals is already fired and ready. I'm Steve Evans along with Brock Yates, Ed Bruce, and you're looking at what could be the race of the entire U.S. Nationals. Near lane, Big Daddy Don Garlic. Far lane, reigning world champion Joe Amato. Well, Steve, uh, there goes Big Daddy backing up as he's done thousands and thousands of times over his long career. But on the other side of the coin, we've got Joe Amato with that. Remember, he was the first guy to show up with the high wing that has literally driven these cars beyond the 260-mile-an-hour mark with consistency. Well, Joe was the first driver to ever go 260. You're right, Bob. Big Daddy says he's going to be the first to go 270. Well, we'll see whether he does it here or not. Right now, he's intent only on beating this beautiful maroon car, Joe Amato's out of Pennsylvania. He is the guy that holds the world title. This is the man that is trying to take it away from him and, of course, win his seventh U.S. National. If Amato does not dispose of Don Garlic here and now, his chances for repeating are nil. It is Garlic and Amato. What a race. As good as it's Billy. Don Garland for the second consecutive year goes into the final round at 5.56 seconds. Amato stumbles to a 5.63. An incredible race. Everything that was billed to be reaching everybody's expectations as Garland's leaves just a week before Amato. Neither of them particularly good reaction times, probably very cautious about a red light. And on goes Big Daddy to a victory marked by the differential of just about the 250-inch wheelbase of his race car. Well, I watched Don Garlitz getting his car ready, and he kept saying, all I got to do is beat the world champion. That's all I got to do. You did it. 263 miles an hour. Pretty good run in this kind of heat. Indeed. You leaned on it for Joe Amato, it looks like. It's kind of cooking over here. 
I couldn't take any chances. I mean, uh, this is a pivotal race in this World Championship Series. I want to win this thing. It's very important to me. Does this take any pressure off at all as far as you're concerned? No, there's more pressure now than ever. I got to beat that kid. <laughs> and that, that kid, you know, we call him the wolf, and he's hungry. Let me tell you what, it may be the kid, then again, it could be Gary Ormsby that will face Big Daddy next round. Let's go back to the starting line and find out. Well, Steve, the kid that Big Daddy is talking about is this young man, that is Daryl Gwynn. They have repaired that air bottle problem that they had. But right now, Daryl's big challenge is this man in this beautiful car, Gary Ormsby. So as these two guys get ready to stage, let's go up to the other end with Joe Amato. Joe, I know how badly you wanted that when the world championship may now be an impossibility for you, really. Yeah, Steve, it's uh, it's going to take a long shot to come in here now because he's, you know, he's running good and maybe somebody can get him in the final. That'll be another 300 points difference. But, uh, you know, we gave it our best shot. I feel bad for the crews and the sponsors that are helping me out because, you know, the pressure's on the driver and you want to go out there and do a good job. And, you know, I think the... I thought the car would pick up a little more horsepower. We made some adjustments, but apparently the heat came in pretty good and we weren't uh, sharp enough on the tune-up a little bit. But you have to leave her feeling a little bit better because the combination's definitely back. Yeah, the car's running good. You know, we're confident that it's going to be an exciting year till the finish line here. It's not over yet. What a good sportsman Joe Amato is. Always gracious in victory or defeat. As we go back down to the starting line to watch the man Big Daddy calls the wolf. Daryl Gwynn getting ready to go against Gary Ormsby. What do you think, Steve? I think that Big Daddy has tremendous respect for Daryl Gwynn. He comes from his home state, Florida. He's watched this young man literally grow up. I mean, from diapers to becoming a sportsman champ and now doing so well in his first year at Top Fuel. Gary Ormsby with a red light and immediately comes to a halt. It's going to be all Daryl Gwynn. And even with the shootout early, Daryl Gwynn with 5.60. But that will give the lane choice to Big Daddy Don Garlitz in the top fuel final. Well, Steve, one way or the other, the U.S. Nationals top fuel title will go to the Sunshine State of Florida as we watch an NHRA official cleaning up some water, just drying it up after it gets spread around out of that burnout box. Back there, that is the Oldsmobile Calais of Warren Johnson's. He's ready to go in the Mr. Gasket semifinals. Now, let's go up to the other end with Daryl Gwynn. Well, I don't know if Don Garlitz's opinion down here earlier had anything to do with it. He seemed to know that you, Daryl Gwynn, were going to win that race, even before it happened. Well, maybe it was kind of the way I felt about him at Englishtown. I knew he was going to win, and we both loved to race each other. And uh, I don't know whether he's taking turns or not, but it's my turn to win. You think Ormsby maybe just got rattled up there, or what do you think? I don't know. The pressure was really on me. Uh, we had a problem right before we fired the car up, and everybody was rushing around trying to get it all ready. And like I, the air bottle? Or something? Yeah, the air bottle uh, was leaking, so we had to go run back to the trailer and put a new one on it. And uh, we got a work cut out for us in the final. Your second final round in your second year of racing. Terrific. Well, uh, I can't thank everybody enough that supported the car. Uh, all the manufacturers, everything. I just can't thank them enough. Garlitz calls you the wolf because you're hungry, you said. <laughs> you got it, very hungry. <laughs> well, this fine young man is going to put some beans on the table one way or the other here at the U.S. Nationals. Okay, Steve, that car, very familiar to the Pro Stock fans, Warren Johnson in the Calais. He is going to go against crafty old Butch Leal. This could be a good race. Well, Leal cut the best light of the day, maybe the best light of his career in round number one. Can he do that again? He will need those sort of reactions if he's to get around Warren Johnson. I asked Leal if he was gambling. He said, no, no, no. I just, you know, this is just skill. I told Warren Johnson, Leal said he doesn't gamble. Johnson said, if his mouth's open, he's lying. <laughs> All right. Up come the revs. Down comes the lights. Good start. But look at this. A red light on the part of Warren Johnson. Got to Johnson a little bit. Johnson was so keyed up to not let Leal away first that he blew it himself. Leal cuts another almost identical light to the first round and wins at a hundredth of a second slower than Warren Johnson. 767 to a 766. Well, that was a big surprise to see Warren Johnson red light. This man, that is Bob Glidden behind the wheel of his Thunderbird. He doesn't red light a whole lot either. Believe me, he is going against the youngster in this business, Bruce Allen, Steve. Well, most of the red lights you see in pro stock are when there's a disparity of performance, uh, but there certainly wasn't against Butch Leal and uh, Warren Johnson. I think the pressure here, the big money is up, an awful lot of prestige. The first running of this Mr. Gasket Pro Stock Challenge, they've worked all year to qualify for it. Uh, seldom 
Uh, is a drag racing driver under this kind of pressure, Brock? Well, it'll be interesting. Of course, Glidden has faced every possible kind of pressure in his long career, and he's overcome it to win five world championships. Their stage, that is the Rare Morrison Championship car against the Glidden Championship car, Red Light. Bob Glidden, Red Light at IRP. hometown fans and Glenn maybe knew something we didn't know he runs a 761 Bruce Allen ran quicker at 759 maybe Bob Glidden figured I've got to gamble and when was the last time you saw Warren Johnson and Bob Glidden red light in back-to-back -back races Underneath Don Garlick's race car, Big Daddy himself and nearest us, Herb Parks, the crew chief. It's a dirty job, but somebody has got to check the bearings in one of these engines. That is absolutely critical. Big Daddy likes what he sees, and it's going back together. You know, Brock Yates, most crews hire somebody to do this big. He does it himself. Absolutely, and he's done it like that for years, ever since he started way back in the middle 1950s. All right, Dale Foley comes to the line in that Buick Somerset Funny Car, and he is going to face John Force, who's done very, very well here today, thanks to both himself and Austin Coyle and the Chi Town Hustler crew who helped him repair. Remember that big blower explosion he had. Well, so often when you really savage one of these cars, as John Force did, it puts you behind trying to those repairs that you never catch up. Well, John came right back with a 574, and that gives him a bit of an elapsed time edge over this beautiful Buick here in the near lane, Dale Poldy. So both these men doing very well here at the U.S. Nationals. That is Austin Coyle guiding John Force back into the staging lane, while Dale Poldy is ready, having already completed his burnout. Got to give the experience edge to Dale Poley. Poley has been in the winner's circle three times in the NHRA competition. He's been a runner-up twice this year, runner-up nine times in his overall career, so he's been to that final round a lot. John Force has only been there twice and he's yet to win one. Now, two excellent crew chiefs, maybe the best in the business. Austin Boyle, crew chief over the far lane. It is Bill Schultz in the near lane. They rank right there with Teddy Bernstein and Dale Armstrong. What a start. They are right together. No tire smoke, no engine smoke. What a drag race. It is Dale Poley. Oh, boy. A 579 at 249 miles an hour. And that engine block just did stay together long enough. Well, look at this. Poley leaves just a little bit ahead of force, just by an eyelash. And from there on in, it is a dead even drag race. And here is Poley winning it by half a car length at the far end. Well, you can hear this Buick funny car kind of sizzling in the background, and no wonder a 579 put away John Forrest, Dale Poley. Well, that's good. She'll set it out to run a good low 580 or a high 70, and that's what it ran. And, uh, we just got to get that tenth to try to catch up with Kenny. Well, Kenny still has a tough fight here to make that final round, but you seem to feel he's going to do that. Well, he's got kind of a tenth on the field, you know, as per se, and uh, he's been pretty darn consistent. He's a tough one to count out. Okay. Thank you. Well, Dale Poldy said it, and everybody agrees, it is this automobile that is the most formidable force here at the U.S. Nationals, as it has been all season, Steve. But as I said before, any time the two Texas cars get together, the Bernstein car, the Raymond Beetalone car with Lombardo, it is a war. Even though they grew up together, went to high school together, there is a tremendous rivalry between Kenny Bernstein and Raymond Beetle. And I know the crew of the Blue Mask car, they have put everything in it to contend with that machine right there. A bad burnout from Kenny Bernstein. Now, that really didn't even get the tires warm. Let's see if Bernstein goes back into the water if he has time to, to do another good tire smoking burnout. The starter motor finally coming off of Raymond Beetle's Blue Max, driven by John Lombardo. The Mustang body is latched down. I'm sure they agreed that Bernstein would start first. Now, maybe Kenny's engine was just cold, Brock. That'll happen sometimes, and it wouldn't respond. But that's not a good sign. I mean, things need to go right from the very beginning. Now, here is Bernstein. He's back in the water. Okay, going to try to put some heat into those tires. Let's see if it responds better this time. Yes, it does, but still not what you'd expect from Bernstein. Not that billowing, strong burnout. You got to get those tires hot. It also helps put some hot rubber down onto the racetrack. Now, long John Lombardo, everything is going just fine for him so far. He's just concentrating on his own car race here. So as these two warriors back up to do battle, let's go down to the end of the track where Brock is with John Force. Well, John, a good, strong pass of 582 and a charge, 257, but it just wasn't enough. Well, it wasn't our day. It was his, so uh, we 
just watch the race from here, I guess. Yeah, we're well, sure. Yeah, uh, no problems, obviously. It just, uh, the race car just didn't play up quite enough, I guess. Just fell off a little bit, that's all. And back at the starting line, the decision about to be made is who will meet Dale Foley in the final round of the U.S. Nationals. Will it be the blue mask car driven by soft-spoken businessman John Lombardo? Will it be the talk of funny car racing the entire season? The points leader towards the world championship, Kenny Bernstein. Fingers in the rear as everyone in the starting line. Away first is John Lombardo. Hit is a Lombardo by a nose at half track. Hit is a Lombardo by a car length at the finish line. The Blue Max, who loves it. 577 for John Lombardo. To an off the pace for him, 582 for Kenny Bernstein. So the funny car final will be Dale Poldy versus John Lombardo, and Lombardo even has the lane choice. Well, here, the finishing touches going on the motor of Daryl Gwynn, and of course, it's that power plant that the young man hopes will help him defeat Big Daddy Don Garlitz in the top fuel final. Right now, let's go to the other end of the track. Brock is with a stun, Kenny Bernstein. And obviously disappointed Kenny Bernstein down here. Suddenly, uh, it's over, Kenny, and I don't think anybody uh, expected it to happen this way. An 82 to a 77, a real tight race. Yeah, well, it's uh, racing, you know. Good days and bad, and Blue Max team just, uh, you know, put away. Was there, was there anything? Do you have any problems at all in the past? Oh, yeah, tons of them. I drove, like, no good at all. I didn't do a good burnout, a wet burnout. I didn't get the tires smoking. And backed up, got back in the, in the wet box again, and it was in high, in uh, low gear, which you can't spin the tires real hard, and tried to do another one, and it smoked them a little, and then did a little dry, and just nothing was right. I just didn't drive very well at all. Well, it's been such a fantastic season for you so far. Uh, I guess that uh, you were just maybe due for a bad day. Well, you know, a bad run. I wouldn't say a bad day, but uh, hats off to Dale Armstrong, my crew. They've worked very hard at it. And, of course, Budweiser, Motorcraft, and Ford, Kangaroos, we're still right there. Well, we're sorry you're out. As well as I know Kenny Bernstein, Brock, that disappointment is not for himself, but for the crew that worked so hard. the greatest drag race of them all, the U.S. Nationals Indianapolis Raceway Park. I'm Brock Gates along with Steve Evans and Ed Bruce. And what you see here is the Mr. Gasket Pro Stock Challenge Finals. And perhaps, Steve Evans, the surprise is what you don't see, not what you do see. That's right. You don't see Warren Johnson or Bob Wood. They both fouled out red line in the previous round. But by no means are these guys lightweight. The four-time world championship team, Warren Morrison, their driver, Bruce Allen, they found him in Michigan, and they considered this to be a training year. Well, he already won the Summer Nationals just a few months ago. Butch Leal, well, he doesn't need any training. Uh, he's been drag racing since the late 50s. Uh, at one time, uh, intended to be a professional golfer. In fact, still shoots below par, but uh, an injured back prevented him from uh, the strain of the tour. But I'll tell you what, he's plenty strong in the NHRA drag racing tour. Now, everybody asking themselves, can Leal get another hole shot? Now, he's left right on time. Almost perfect line two rounds in a row and he needs to do it again because quite honestly Bruce Allen has the stronger car. No question about it the rare Morrison specialists are just great engine builders and they do put a whole bunch of horsepower into the throttle foot of Bruce Allen so he may be able to lay back here just a stroke in hopes that maybe Leo will squeeze the light too hard. Leo's playing a little game here put a little pressure on the rookie driver. Leo will slow to stage but I'll be darned it is Bruce Allen off the mark first. Chris Allen is away first. Butchfield trying to cut him down and cannot do it. Bruce Allen wins at 760 to a 767. Turnabout is indeed fair play, Mr. Butch. And he sure didn't shake the kid because Bruce Allen shows all kinds of professional poise here, leaving just a little bit of the expert ahead of the expert, Butch Leal, and going on to a convincing victory. So, there it is. You've got your winner here in the Mr. Gasket Pro Stock Final, and it's the young man from Michigan, Bruce Allen. On to victory here, an excellent race. Well, there's a man that's $15,000 richer. Bruce Allen is the Mr. Gasket Pro Stock Challenge champion. Congratulations. Thank you. Feels good. That's for Buddy and Dave. They were very confident going to the starting line, not nervous at all, just had total trust in you. Yeah, uh, they make it pretty easy for me. They sure, I can't tell you how important that is. Those two guys just, boy, they, they give me all the confidence in the world, and they just tell me that I can do it. And 
It just sure makes it easy. A lot of the folks down here uh, maybe wagering a bob or two one way or the other all thought that Leal would leave the starting line first and you'd drive around him. You left first by 200. So you, you did it all. Well, Butch is an awful good driver. It's awful hard to beat him. And that just makes you all the more pumped. You know, you go up there knowing that you've got to leave on time, and that just, it's always great race race. You, my friend, are an awfully good driver as well. Uh, I'm still the weak link in our organization, but I'm going to improve. <laughs> Maybe the most modest, but I doubt the weakest link. Uh, excellent, excellent job by Bruce Allen. All right, Steve Evans, this man, John Lombardo, the quiet man of funny car racing, he's got to be pumped. He just put away Kenny Bernstein to get into the finals here at the U.S. Nationals against Dale Poldy. I wouldn't begin to pick a favorite in this. I think it's uh, it's a pick em deal. Dale Poley, lots of experience we discussed before. John Lombardo, he's been there. He is so cool. I doubt that either driver will make a mistake. It's probably going to depend on how well the cars were prepared between the semifinals and the final. This is really a dead even deal. Well, of course, the uh, Blue Max car, Raymond Beetle, has been in victory lane here at the U.S. Nationals before, but never with John Lombardo at the wheel, nor has Dale Poley ever won it. So the desire level has got to be sky high here. Oh, absolutely. And as I said, Dale, both of these drivers are so good. The cars are first quality. Uh, there is no as Bruce Allen says, weak link. They lay it together. A little bit of advantage to John Lombardo. He's going to need it. John Lombardo won that one right on the starting line. 578 takes the blue max to the winner circle raymond beetle you saw there in the white shirt uh but dale pulley's engine went a little bit sour on the top end you saw all the smoke out of it in fact there was a huge difference in speed 257 to a 213. yep and that has to be the result of some problems as dale pulley's engine goes away on him at the far end of the racetrack it could have been even closer than it was an excellent race at three-quarter track right here and there you can see dale starting to smoke his motor and that was the end of it as john lombardo goes on to win it well as john lombardo peels off the fire suit and the gloves he says it's a little sticky in here the humidity well up in the 80s maybe even the 90s but right now this driver and the crew of the blue max i'm sure feeling no pain in his first year of employment as the driver for this car Qualified low at the Winter Nationals now wins your first ever U.S. Nationals title, John. It's got to feel good. Thank you very much. It really does. We have, everybody's been thrashing on the car, the crew, the people, Raymond. I mean, we put out a lot of effort, and it looks like it's finally paying off. Well, crew Chief Dale Emery will be quick to get credit from you and Raymond Beetle. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he, he makes all the decisions on the car, and Raymond supports him 100%, and the crew works with him, and we all uh, seem to be... Uh, just working along as smooth as it can be with no problems. Your driving has been just perfection, really. Well, we've been uh, holding our own, I think, everywhere. There'll be a party somewhere tonight in Indianapolis. Oh, I'm sure there will. <laughs> Little John Lombardo, his first ever U.S. Nationals title, a calm guy. As he gets congratulations from the man he defeated, a sportsman-like gesture from Dale Poldy. These guys had an awful lot at stake. John Lombardo won it. And look at this. The wave comes to the U.S. Nationals at Indianapolis, setting the stage for the biggest race of the day, the finals in Top Fuel. Well, out of the over 1,000 cars that started racing here at the U.S. Nationals five days ago, only two remain, Don Garlitz and Daryl Gwen. First, let's go to Brock Yates with Dale Poley at the other end. What a valiant effort by Dale Poley. Dale, a 78 to an 87. You just kind of reversed the numbers, uh, and you came up on the short end, but it was a super race. Well, we've been trying to stay out of that right lane there all day long, and the car got out there and just shook a lot, and it just I just couldn't get it to quit shaking and stuff, and that slowed us down. But uh, I'm glad it was John, if anybody else. Seemed like uh, you showed a little bit of smoke about halfway down. Uh, did you feel, did, was she starting to let loose on you? We've been hurting it all weekend long, and we just took a wild try at changing something, and that's just uh, that's how it goes. Uh, Bill Schultz, Mike Hamby, and the whole crew did a real good job on this car. Sure did. Congratulations. I know you had a super season. You'll be back. Thank you. Don Garland. The wing high in the air on the fastest car in all of drag racing. 265 miles an hour in Atlanta, the middle of the summer, but all the speed in the world won't win you a drag race. You've got to have that elapsed time. Big Daddy has pumped it up for the car that just streaked through the picture. That is Daryl Gwynn. The young and the old. Big Daddy at 53. Daryl Gwynn at 23. Both from the state of Florida. Brock Yates, who do you like? Well, I think you've got to go with the old man. He has just uh, been such a powerhouse in this sport for almost 30 years. A massive experience. The car's running well. 
And you have to know that Daryl is feeling the kind of pressure against this old professional, the greatest drag racer of them all, I suppose. And when you run your car out of the family bank account, that's additional pressure, too. And Daryl Gwynn faces that. Now, Big Daddy, you know, he won here a year ago. Everybody knows that story, I guess. The car off the museum floor, over four years old. Well, this is a car he built especially for this season. But uh, it's had its problems, too. He flipped it upside down at Phoenix, Arizona earlier this year. But uh, he didn't bother to build a new one like Daryl Gwynn did. Big Daddy just got out the torches and a bumper jack and straightened it all out. Daryl Gwynn's car is a debut Ahara chassis built in uh, Northern California. But the family does all the engine work, all the tuning. Now, Big Daddy, he does all the engine work, aided by the man in the yellow shirt there, Herb Parks, and the blue cap. Now, Big Daddy with his rear view mirrors on the car. I think they came off about a 51 Ford. And he's got those on there, Brock, so that he can see the exhaust lights, see if all the cylinders are firing right. Boy, he thinks of everything and has for years and years. Of course, the first man to come with an effective mid-engine dragster of the modern type that everybody now runs and really has been in the forefront of technology right from the start. The final race of the U.S. Nationals is at hand. You don't have to fix them if you burn them up. They leave right together. A good leap. Tire smoke on the Daryl Gwynn's car. That is going to smell his demise. Her mark fifth in the air for Big Daddy Don Garland. Two in a row, his seventh U.S. Nationals title. 557, 260 miles an hour. His pal Art Malone with him for years, cheering him on to victory. And here it is again. A good, solid race for about half track, Steve. That's right, but then Daryl Gwynn lost traction, Brock. Well, Steve, you can see Daryl's chances sort of erode here. First in tire smoke, and now what appears to be some smoke from the engine as Big Daddy Don Garland goes on to a decisive victory, and perhaps even more important, to put a virtual hammerlock on his second NHRA Top Fuel World Championship. Two drivers from Florida, both with the initials DG, 30 years difference in their age, and it's the experience that pays off, the handling, the motor building. Don Garlitz, congratulations. Two in a row, and how many now, U.S. Nationals title? This is the seventh one. Well, no one else can say that in any category. No, I don't know. I, I, sometimes I don't keep track of them, but uh, this, is, this is the race, you know. It's just where it really counts. Did you and the young man have any conversation before you climbed in? Oh, we certainly did. We both told each other to have a safe ride. Daryl and I are the dearest of friends. And of course, I'm smart enough to realize I'm not going to be doing this forever. And Daryl's going to be doing it a lot longer than I am. I'll tell you, he is a young comer. You call him the wolf. He is the wolf, and he's hungry. <laughs> and these points will go a long way towards a world championship, something you want so badly for you and your crew and your wife and family. Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important thing to us. And uh, it'll cushion our lead. It doesn't make us the winner, but it'll cushion us a little bit. We can. Uh, not quite so much pressure. <laughs> Congratulations again. Don Garlitz, U.S. Nationals champion, two years in a row. Okay, let's go to Brock Yates, who's with the young man, defeated today, but Big Daddy says could be the heir to the throne. Well, as Daryl Wynn takes off his helmet and some of the other crewmen congratulate Daryl, excellent job. I know you're, you're disappointed, but as the guy just pointed out, to make the finals at the Nationals first time out in top field, you've got to feel some satisfaction. Yeah, I was ready for Retaliation, though, but uh, I am happy to be here, and uh, I did the best possibly I could, and that's all I've got right now at this time. Wait a couple more races, and we'll be right there. Was it was it just a question, a little bit more power on Garla's part, uh, or did uh, were there some things that you'd like to do over again in the past? Well, um, possibly my uh, our tune-up was maybe a little off. Um, we don't have the experience that uh, Don's got. Nobody does. That's true. Um, <laughs> But we're happy just to be here with the experience we've got of less than six to eight months. I've got to thank everybody that's been a part of this race car because it has been motivating. It sure has. And you, everybody's delighted with your performance. And we're sorry you lost, but we congratulate you for making the final. Thank you very much. And Brock, just a matter of time before we talk to that young man in victory instead of defeat. Even Big Daddy Don Garlitz knows that as he shakes the hand of Daryl Gwynn. A fitting conclusion to the NHRA U.S. Nationals. The executive producer of Diamond T Sports is Harvey M. Palish. Produced and directed by John B. Mullen. Promotional consideration provided for and a fee paid by the Style Auto World Championship team, the nation's premier source of fast lane fashions. Style Auto, the champion's choice for the style of your life. And by Suzuki, choice of 10-time national champion Terry Vance. See the complete line of world-class performance bikes at your Suzuki dealer today. Suzuki works like a single moving part.
American Sports Cavalcade has been a presentation of Diamond D Sports.